Hello everyone, about a year ago I bought this Sony a7 IV after using Canon cameras for over 10 years. In this video, while I'm visiting the beautiful Alps, I want to talk about how the switch went during the last year. I also want to answer two questions. First of all, do I regret buying the Sony a7 IV? And is the Sony a7 IV the best hybrid mirrorless camera in 2023? Let's get started by rolling the intro. For those of you who are new to this channel, I'm Luc Benoit Ralford, a young photographer and filmmaker on the journey to become better at this art. Let's start by talking about why I switched from Canon to Sony in the first place. So for the last few years, I've been looking to buy a new camera because I wanted to be able to start filming some 4K videos with better video qualities. I also wanted a slightly better photo camera, so this is what I was looking for inside of the cameras. Canon was really slow to come out with its mirrorless line and I was waiting for mirrors because I knew they're going to be the future, uh, but it didn't come with any of the cameras are really interesting for me. The R5 was way too expensive and the R6 had most of the features I wanted but also they cut in weird places for some features I really was looking for. On the other side, Sony came out with the Sony a7 IV and it had everything I wanted on the video side and it also had everything I needed on the photo side. So overall, it was just a perfect fit for me. I knew I needed to change all my lenses because the RF system was new, so this was the perfect time to switch to Sony because anyways, I would have to change everything for my camera system. Now let's talk about the ergonomics of this camera. Overall, it feels really good. The grip is good and feels solid once it's in your hand. It's not as big as something like the Canon, so it's not as good as the grip on the Canon camera, but overall, it feels perfectly fine. One neat, very neat feature here that I really like is being able to toggle between photo and video mode simply by using the dial here. It's super quick and fast, and for somebody like me that just passes between photo and video all the time, I can keep my settings for both modes separate. It's a must-have feature, and I really love this on this camera. Another little neat thing is on the side right here, I can actually open my microphone and plug in the microphone, and it still works with the tilt screen, which is a great thing because it was so annoying on my current camera having to unplug the microphone every time I wanted to tilt around the screen to get a different view angle. So overall, there's not much I can say for the ergonomics here. It's just amazing. It feels good. It works well. The buttons are well laid out, so there's not much I can say that isn't great about it. And one is a little gripe here is when you're taking out the uh, battery right here, it's on the opposite side of the uh, Canon cameras. It just doesn't feel natural here because the shape of the battery right here fits to go on the side here, but it goes on the other one. There's small little things, but one is really great. The other one is just a little bit annoying, and I'm sure there's a reason for that, but I don't know why. Maybe a patent that can hold or something like that. Now let's talk about the autofocus of the Sony a7 IV because this is one of the main reasons why I decided to buy this camera. I remember that a few years ago I was laughing about how bad the autofocus was on the Sony cameras, but they definitely catch up and I even think they're better than the Canon cameras these days. When taking some photos, it's super quick and accurate with about 100% coverage, which means that whatever you have inside of your shot, it's always going to be in focus. It's also really great because it's super sticky with a subject. So for example, if I'm in a burst mode, taking some pictures of my sister or friend uh, going down skiing, it's actually going to stick on the subject, the person going down while skiing, and it's going to make sure that that subject is perfectly in focus. In the video mode, the autofocus is also really good and it's super sticky on faces and even on eye detection, making sure that when I'm vlogging or making these types of videos, I don't have to be thinking about the autofocus too much. I know my shots are going to be perfectly in focus. So overall, I really love the autofocus on this system. It's really fast, it's accurate. There's really nothing to say that is bad about it. It's almost perfect 100% of the time.
decided to come out and take some pictures of the stars at night. If you know me, you know I love doing some astrophotography. And one very important thing when I chose a Sony a 7 IV was that it was going to be a good low light camera. It's simply amazing in video right now, even though the picture might not be perfect, it's still totally usable, which wasn't the case with my Canon camera before. And the picture and the video just look really great at night. I would say the big difference is much more on the video side where it's much more usable than the one from the Canon, but the pictures look great too. Uh, so now I'm just gonna find a spot here where I can take some astrophotography shots, set it up and talk a little bit more about why this is so good on the Sony A7 IV. I finally found a spot to take some pictures of the stars. It's not exactly the view I wanted, but there's a mountain, there's some nice houses here, and there's a stars at the top, so it's good enough. It was actually really hard finding some stars inside of downtown Chamonix because there's just so much light pollution everywhere, but I still got a bunch of cool shots at night of the village instead. Now, I really like taking some night shots using my Sony a7 IV, and this is because it's a really good camera in low light conditions. This is probably just because it's so good at handling the ISO. So when you're taking the pictures of, let's say, the stars or things like that, it comes out so sharp, so detailed. Uh, there's so much information and it's really clean overall. It doesn't mean that there's no problems with ISO at all. I still have to apply some noise reductions or things like that. But for example, if I'm taking a shot of astrophotography with the stars on my Canon I might see something like something like a thousand stars in the st uh, sky and if I take the same picture with my Sony camera I might see something like I would say 10,000 stars I'm exaggerating a little bit here but you understand the point that I just see way much more detail inside of the shot on the Sony so first astrophotography it's actually a really good camera then on the video it just destroys whatever I was getting on the Canon. The Canon above 1600 was just terrible in low light. I know they're better these days, but still Canon still struggles sometimes when you're in low light conditions. Where the Sony right here, uh, this is not even the best Sony camera for low light conditions, uh, but I can get really good videos at night. So if I'm at 8000 ISO, or 3200 ISO. These are two native ISOs. So you can get really clean and good looking images at those ISOs. But right now I'm filming at 12,800 ISO. This is crazy high. I know the image is not perfect, but it's still good enough to be filming in 4K and getting a nice little shot. While I'm walking towards Agrid's Midzi for a fabulous 360 degree view, let's talk about the image civilization. The Sony a7 IV has IBIS or in-body image civilization, which was a big selling point for me because it meant I would get more stable shot. In the photo modes, it works great. It allows to get some photos at 1 30th of a second or even 1 10th of a second in both conditions. And it works great by stabilizing the shot and allowing to get crisp and sharp photos in the end. It's more in the video modes where I have some problems because it doesn't work quite as well as Canon does. I think the reason for this is that most Canon's lens have image stabilization inside of them, which is not the case for most of the Sony lenses and third-party Sony lenses that don't have image stabilization inside of the lens, only inside of the IBIS and digital one. Right now when, filming, uh, when I'm filming this talking head shot, I'm using the active stabilization, so digital stabilization, plus the IBIS, and it's still quite wobbly. The good news of Sony is actually that there's a solution to this problem, and it's using their software, which is called Telus Browse, that allows you to use the gyro data that's embedded in every file that Sony creates to stabilize the shot and get almost gimbal-like shots in the end. I wouldn't totally rely on this because it's quite a long process, it's a little bit slow to use that, that software to stabilize the shots, but when you need to get some stable shots and you don't have a gimbal with you, it's actually a pretty good option in the end. Just make sure you don't use the active mode on the camera and just leave it at standard or even no stabilization at all and leave the software do all the job afterwards. It's actually gonna be really impressive what you're gonna get in the end. Before I get to the top of the mountain right here, I want to talk about the colors on the Sony a7 IV. This is one of the reasons it took me so much time to switch to Sony, because the colors were never that quite good. Overall, I think these days they're pretty good, but they're not perfect, especially in photo modes. In video, usually I think their picture profiles are pretty good, and you can edit them a little bit and make them look pretty good pretty quickly. But on the photo modes, I don't understand, but this camera likes making everything very blue 
or very green. And this is kind of a problem when taking some pictures because when you get to edit them or if you just want to quickly post them, it's almost impossible to get the perfect look. This is something where Canon has always been really, really good at producing just very natural and good color looking colors. I know not everybody loves them, but usually if you just want to take a picture, post it right away, Canon is just much better at doing that than the Sony cameras. With that being said, it's not a big deal because I edit all my photos anyway, so it's just tweaking the temperature and the color tint in the end. Uh, but it's just a little another set to do, which is a little bit more annoying when using the Sony a7 IV. I made it to the top here and wow, this is one of the craziest tourist attractions I've ever seen. The views are simply crazy. It all starts here on the crazy cold platform here. The winds are truly crazy, but we quickly start going inside and walking through different tunnels, which is much more warm. So exiting the tunnel right here, we get our first amazing views in the background here. It's simply amazing, wow. But you're gonna see there's something even cooler coming up in just a moment. Walking to the end of the viewing deck right here, we get to this pretty cool thing. And right here, it's a nice tunnel. I wasn't expecting this at all. How cool is it to be able to walk around underneath the ice here all around and you have crazy views in the background here and all around. This is so cool. Getting to the end of the tunnel here, we have some few steps and we go up to reveal some even crazier views. Right in the back here, we have Mont Blanc, but it's right there, we're so close to it. It's kind of crazy. It's pretty cool, I have the full viewing deck to myself right here. I can have a 360 degree views with nobody around, but my hands are freezing. It's minus 26 degrees, if not worse here. And with the wind, it's even colder. So I'm gonna head back down and continue to the next point. We're gonna see, we're gonna go in a little tunnel or in the next point, which is pretty cool. But first we have to go through the ice tunnel again. This is so cool. I still cannot believe all of what we have around here. I wasn't expecting most of this at all. But look at the next tunnel we're going through right here. Am I the only one that really loves this little tunnel? It's so cool. It's funny, going up these stairs, I can really feel that I'm missing some oxygen. Uh, I kind of got adapted because I've been here for over an hour, but going up these stairs, you really feel the altitude kicking in. That's kind of crazy, but we're here at our next crazy viewpoint. Let's get out right here to look at it. It's amazing. While I'm basically alone on the deck here, let's talk about the image quality of the Sony a7 IV. It's simply amazing. The pictures with the 33 megapixel sensor are super sharp in detail and there's so much information inside of there. The only little thing you can nitpick is that the highlights tend to clip out a lot so you have to be careful not clipping them when taking pictures so you tend to be better to underexpose and then you can recover it afterwards other than overexposing. This can be quite a problem with days like right here with a lot of white and the snow so I have to be careful for small little things uh, for that but apart from that the pictures are just 
amazing overall. There's not much to say here, they're just great. I made it to the top here and wow, the views are amazing. So again, we have Mont Blanc in the background here. We have Italy. We have some super nice looking mountains in the background. It's just crazy the views you get all around here. And it's basically 360 degree views uh, all around that are just super amazing. So wow, enjoying the view now. The view is amazing. I just cannot get enough of it. Talking of amazing, another thing that's amazing on the Sony a7 IV is the video quality. It's super high resolution. If it's over sample 4K, so it just looks really sharp and detailed. There's so much information inside of it. I recently also started filming with S-Log 3, which just adds more dynamic range inside of it, which makes it really great when I want to color grade it afterwards so I can have more of the highlights and also the shadows inside of the shot and just makes the whole image look really, really great. There's some things that some people complain about. So for example, that there is a crop when you use 4K 60 frames per second. That's not an issue for me because I'm actually usually using that when I'm taking slow motion. So I don't really mind it cropping in in that case. I also only have 120 frames per second at 1080p, but honestly, I never really Okay, so I actually got really unlucky here. My microphone completely froze and I lost the audio for the rest of this clip and only realized a few days later. But basically what I was saying here is that I really don't care not having 4K for 120 frames per second just because I don't really use that mode at all uh, and most of the times. And when I do need it, 120 frames per second at 1080p is good enough for me simply because the video quality is so good that even 1080p is good enough in this case. Overall, I really don't have any complaints about the video quality. It surpassed my expectations with the oversample 4K. It looks really sharp, detailed. There's so much information with 422, 10-bit. You can pretty much color grade it however you want. There's the information, the highlights, the shadows, and there's a lot of dynamic range. So really, there isn't, isn't much I can complain about. The autofocus is also really strong in video mode. So overall, it's a great video camera. Let's go back to Chamonix. towards the next key station but then realized there were super nice views along the way so decided to drop off take a few pictures and videos and while i'm walking where i want to get i want to talk about why the videos are a little jittery today so it might look a little bit choppy and that's because i forgot my nd filters back home when leaving for this trip i didn't bring any with me so that's why i cannot use anything to get some nice motion blur if you don't know what's motion blur, I have other videos that talk about that. Uh, but that's not the Sony that has a problem and makes the video jittery. That's a user error where I didn't bring the proper equipment to fix this. Let's talk about the thing that annoys me the most on the Sony a7 IV, and this is the menu system. So this camera has a new Sony menu system, which is much better than the old one, but still not great at all compared to Canon. Canon is so easy to use, you just understand what you're doing, but here, it's just so complex to use. One really good thing about the Sony menu system is that you can customize everything. When I say everything, basically anything you think about, you can do it and you can customize it, which is really great. The downside with that is that there's so many options inside of a menu, and a lot of them, even though they're written in English, it doesn't really sound like English and you have to Google all the time the terms that they're using to 
understand what it's doing and how to change them to get the results you want. So that's super annoying. And this is so complex. So by accident, when I was on my trip last time, I reset the whole camera. And when I did that, I had to pass something like three, four hours to reset all the settings on the camera because there's so many things to do, so many things to understand, so many errors you can do. So it's just a pain having to reset everything from zero. Uh, and that's not a great thing. You want things to be easy to access and customizable. Another thing that's missing inside of the menu system, and that's, I don't know why they don't have this option. All my Canons had that option, was that if I'm doing some bulb timer, uh, bulb photos, there's no option to set a timer. So for example, if I'm taking a five minute, 10 minute picture, on a Canon camera, I can tell them that in bulb mode, you, I wanna have a maximum shutter of five or 10 minutes. And this is great for astrophotography, but here I have to use an external app or use a remote control to be able to control the camera for these settings. So this is just a little bit annoying. Why put all these menu options and not even have these more basic options inside of it. Okay, so let's talk about the build quality of this camera and overall it's phenomenal. It's all built in plastic, but it's super hard plastic and it doesn't feel bad at all in the hand. It actually feels really good and solid. Plastic in this case, I think is better because when you go outside in cold, if you go under rain or things like that, plastic is just gonna resist better in all these conditions. And that's exactly what I did. I brought it instead of snow, instead of rain, and it always works perfectly, whatever the type of conditions I have it in. So for that, I think it's really great. The batteries also last really long, so that's a good thing because there's not as much metal or things like that. So they keep lasting for days, even in cold weather. And the only little thing I have about the build quality is that they don't have this little plastic thing at the top. Actually, they had one at the beginning, but I lost it and I have to buy some new ones. And when that's missing, actually, if the water goes in, the camera starts complaining that there's a problem with the connection at the top of the hot shoe mount. So that's a small little thing of it. But apart from that, it's really great overall. And there's not much I can complain about the build quality of this camera. While I'm alone in the cabins, let's talk about editing the files. So for the photo files, like I said before, there's a little bit more editing involved here compared to the Canon files because you have to change the color temperature and the tint on almost every single picture. It's crazy the amount of detail and data you get inside of the files. The raw files have so much detail inside of the highlights and the shadow, you can really play with it and create the unique look you want with the files. On the video side too, like I mentioned earlier in this video, I started in grading my videos with S-Log3 and I love this. There's so much to play, just like with raw photos, it's not as much information, but still a lot of information inside of the highlights and the shadow, and you can really create a better looking image. So overall, it's not a problem at all being editing these photos and videos. You really have a lot of options on that side. I would say one of the problems of editing all these files is not necessarily editing related to editing, it's the data storage you have to have for all of this. So the files are huge. So a raw photo on the Sony a 7 IV is about 40 to 50 megabytes, which is insanely big when you take a lot of photos. And then the 4K videos are insanely big, especially when you're taking some um, S, like some 10 bit videos like I'm doing with SLOG3. Uh, these files can be easily gigabytes big. And for a video like I'm filming right now, uh, so for just this 12, uh, 12 20 minute uh, YouTube video, it's gonna be about 500 gigabytes of video. So this is why I have a NAS back home to store all of these files. But if you're getting a camera like this, you really need to be ready to store a ton and a ton of data. You cannot just have a laptop a hard drive or something like that. You're gonna fill it up right away super fast. So just make sure you have plenty of storage if you're planning on buying the Sony a7 IV. It's so beautiful all around here. Before concluding this video, I wanna talk about a few things I learned in last year while switching from Canon 
to the Sony a7 IV. So first of all, you should buy some lenses that are made for the Sony cameras, not try to do like I did and buy a Metabones adapter that allowed me to put my Canon lenses on the Sony camera because the experience just wasn't good. I actually returned the Metabones adapter a few weeks later because it was working fine for photos, but it was terrible for video. So I just ended up investing in some Tamron lenses. These are a little bit cheaper, but they're still really great quality and I have three of these lenses these days. So this was a great investment to really get the full potential of the Sony camera. The second is to customize the menus and buttons to make everything work exactly as you want. This just makes the whole process a lot easier to use because I have my own custom menus and also have my own custom buttons so I can always quickly find and fine tune the settings as I wish without having to go through the whole menu because like I said before, going through the whole menu is a terrible experience. Another little annoying thing that I never figured out is that when I take a picture on the Canon cameras, you get a preview right away by default. On Sony, this is off. There's an option to put a two second preview, but I don't love this option because when it shows up, if I half press the shutter button, it doesn't always automatically go back to the live preview. So sometimes, especially when I'm on burst mode or something like that, it can be a little bit hard to get the pictures I want to when using this two second preview mode. Overall, it's not that bad, but it's just a little, little thing in the Sony camera that annoys me a little bit more. The final thing that definitely annoys me the most on the Sony cameras, and this is for all the mirrorless cameras, not only the Sony a7 IV, and it's the dust on the sensor. On my Canon camera, I basically never cleaned the sensor and it was totally fine. There was never dust either on my lens or on my camera. But here, almost every single time I'm switching my lenses, I have to remove some dust from the sensor or the lens. So this is just super annoying with these types of mounts. that You get so much dust on them. Now the two questions I'm left to answer is, do I regret buying the Sony a7 IV? And is this the best hybrid mirrorless camera in 2023? So first of all, I do not regret at all buying this camera. It's great, I think you understood why in this video. Overall, it works really well for what I want. It takes great photos, it takes great video. So I do not regret buying it at all and switching from Canon to Sony. It's not a perfect camera, but I would also say that it's a pretty good one in 2023. Uh, Canon did come out with a Canon R6 Mark II that is more similar to this camera, but I still think that Sony just has overall a lot more for your money when buying this camera. So I think that even in 2023, if you're looking for a really good photo camera that can take really good videos too, this is a really good choice for you. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting the like button in the bottle and definitely subscribe for more content on photography and filmmaking. See you in the next one. It's simply amazing in video, right? Also looks amazing in photo. And wow, this is one of the craziest tourist attracts. Simply crazy. Amazing. Totally crazy. It all starts here on the crazy cold platform here. The winds are totally crazy, but we put amazing views in the back. Simply amazing. Wow. Even cooler coming up to this pretty cool thing. How cool is it to be able to walk around all around and you have crazy views in the background here. This is so cool. Some even crazier views. Kind of crazy. It's pretty cool. I have to find the next point, which is pretty cool. This is so cool. I still cannot believe all of what we have around here. That's kind of crazy, but crazy viewpoint. It's amazing. I really love this little tunnel. It's so cool. Amazing views at the top there. Wow, the views are amazing. It's just crazy. The views you get all around here. Super amazing. So. Wow, it's simply amazing. The pictures are just amazing overall. Overall, they're amazing. It's so beautiful all around here. Can't stop looking around at the beautiful views.